Yeah, good morning everyone. Thank you for having me this morning. I'm very happy to be here. Um, thank you for having me. My name is Chris uh, Niederberger. You just forget the Niederberger, just call me Chris. <laughs> Difficult name from Switzerland. Um, you just, on one slide, you just saw my wife and my three kids. My wife couldn't come this morning because she suffered a heat stroke yesterday, just so she stayed home um, yeah, with the kids. I'm in Taiwan since seven years and I'm uh, serving at the Pearl Family Garden. Uh, thank you for your support, for your continuously supporting this ministry and I'm happy to just share with you today uh, about our ministry. Yeah, today I brought a story with me from the Bible which is linked to what we do in the Pearl. Um, the Bible passage from today is from Luke 14, verses 15 to 24. Jesus was invited to a party, to a feast, and as they were there, they were just talking about who has the honor to kind of sit close to the host, you know. I don't know if they had already name tags or name cards on the tables, but it's like at the wedding it's the same, you know. Everybody wants to sit close to the, to the groom and the bride. And here as well, they were talking, who has actually the honor to sit close to the host? And while they were just talking about that, and they were just enjoying the time probably together, uh, one man said to Jesus, wow, blessed must be the man who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus is an absolutely good storyteller. He has just this ability the, to just pick up words from people or just like situations in people's daily lives which are familiar to everyone and turn it into a lesson about God's kingdom and just explain something about uh, yeah, how God sees uh, a situation. And often it's very different. So Jesus starts to tell a story there was a big feast. A man was planning a big feast. And he invited a lot of people to this feast. And the invitations were sent out. And in the meanwhile, everything was being prepared. And then he finally said to his servant, Go out and now tell these people that everything is ready. They can come to the feast. So he went out, his servant, but suddenly... The people started to actually uh, decline this invitation. The first said, sorry, I just bought a field. I have to see it. The second said, I bought five uh, yoke of oxen and I have to try them out. And the third said, sorry, I've just got married. I can't come. So this servant came back to his master and said, um, um, they all declined the invitation. So this master told them again, okay, go out and bring in the crippled, the, bl the blind, the lame. So the servant again went out and invited them. And then he came back and said, there is still room for more. So the host said, then go again, go out of, this, out of the city and bring in these people too. So there he went and then he came back and the feast could eventually start. What can we learn from this story today? Ah, now that it has stopped, that's good. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, what can we learn from this story? There is an invitation, a wonderful invitation. A host, host invites and he makes sure no expense was spared. He has prepared everything. Just a wonderful invitation. And he wants to uh, have the people around. He loves. The host of this story represents God. God is this host. And this invitation is still valid today for us. No matter, no matter if it's in Switzerland or Taiwan or um, at, in, on every, in every place on earth. God wants us to be part of his party and he spared no expense now God has offered us his mercy his forgiveness his grace his love 
his joy, his peace, a purpose in life. And on top of that, he gives us eternal life in heaven. He's not a distant God in in the universe somewhere, but he's close to us and he wants to be close to everybody who actually seeks him with his whole heart. And the servant in this story represents Jesus, who makes himself a servant, come to earth and actually takes the cross, uh, yeah, goes until the cross for us. Uh, He took upon him torture and pain to actually win our hearts, that we may have access to God's kingdom, to be part of this feast in heaven. Jesus once tells us, He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Who is a God like this? And Jesus comes and tells you, everything is ready. You know, usually gods here in Taiwan as well, they are usually asking you to do something for them. They don't do something (laughs) for you in advance, but they ask you to do something and maybe they'll help you then. But there is a God who actually is looking for you, who actually came down on earth to take so so much, uh, yeah, to, to... He did so much for you and while you were still a sinner, while you still didn't like him. So should not everybody say, you know, blessed is the one who will eat at a feast in the kingdom of heaven? We would think, of course. Hmm? But then something unexpected happens. Yeah? Instead of receiving this invitation with joy, the invited people, one by one, decline God's invitation. The first said, I just bought a field. Sorry, I can't come. The field here stands for earthly possessions. It stands for cars, houses, assets, earthly things we consider more important than God's invitation. You know, usually when you buy a field, you go and look at it beforehand, you know. I've never seen a person who just buys something and then he goes and sees what he has bought. It's kind of, what a surprise. <laughs> Usually you go first and see, okay, what's, what's the field like? What's the house like? And then you buy it. But you don't kind of buy it and then you go. So we see it's, there are flimsy, actually, excuses. The second one says, you know, I've just bought uh, five yoke of oxen and I want to try them out. The oxen stand for our work, our career, our job, our own life plans. Things that hinder us to accept that invitation. I have a friend and she said to me, you know, I know that Jesus actually is the truth. But you know, she, she has a good job and she said, you know, if I would follow Jesus, I know I would have to change a lot in my life and I'm just not willing to. And I think sometimes that can hinder us, you know, to actually accept this invitation. Another thing is, yeah, I just got married, you know. Uh, We we can understand, you know, whoever whoever is is going on their honeymoon doesn't want to be disturbed, you know, (laughs) usually. Um, But the wedding is just standing for relationships and can kind of hinder us to accept this invitation. Uh, at the Pearl, people uh, sometimes told me, you know, I can't accept Jesus because my mother or my father is a devout Buddhist. You know, I just can't accept Christ in my life because of my relatives. Or I would probably have to break up with a friend because I know this relationship is not what Jesus wants. So that can hinder us as well to accept that invitation. Now, what's God's reaction to this? He gets angry. And first it sounds maybe weird to actually see God angry. But if we put ourselves into God's shoes, and you know, I've never, I don't know if you have prepared your wedding, you bought your dress, you prepared uh, the food, the location, everything, you know, a lot of money has been spent and then nobody shows up. How would you feel? 
Have you ever been to a wedding where nobody showed up? I don't think so, you know. I'm <laughs> that would be hard. And so we can understand kind of that reaction. And I've perf myself kind of prepared in the church in Switzerland some events, kind of we made decoration, bought a lot of food, kind of prepared everything. And then guess what? Nobody showed up, you know. And that, I still know that feeling. I still remember that feeling when you just prepare so much but nobody shows up. But you know, God's love is bigger than that. He doesn't give up. So he again sends his servant, Jesus, out on the streets again. Go quickly and bring in the poor, the cripples, the blind and the lame. And he goes and he comes back and there's still room for more. So then again, he goes and invites more people Yeah, but he also says, who's uh, declining that invitation lightheartedly will not be part of God's feast in heaven. God is looking for humble hearts. Those who are humble acknowledge with thankfulness their dependence on the Lord. A humble heart understands that it always needs support from God. Humility is the admission that our talents and abilities are gifts from God. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Because of that, we don't see many rich people, many wise people, many kind of skilled people among Christians. Because God said, I want to, um, I have chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God said, I have chosen the weak things to shame the strong. To actually be able to invite, to actually accept that invitation, we need humble hearts. And God is looking for people who have that humble heart, who are willing to actually uh, accept that invitation, who know that they're, they're dependent on God. The same way Jesus humbled himself to become one of us. And I think there is no other God who just made humble himself who know how our hearts are, what, what it is to be human with all our fears, our struggles. And I think that's so comforting to know that Jesus knows how we feel as humans. And he came to earth to actually invite us to God's kingdom. And yeah, to go to the streets to actually invite people, that's what we do at the Pearl Family Garden. We go to the streets and to the roads and alleys and we invite people, the homeless, the insignificant, the sick, the prostitutes, the people with a strong smell, the people nobody wants. Around two uh, times a week, more or less, we'll go out to the streets in the red light district of Juan Juan, we, we invite uh, those people and we just start building relationships with them. And it takes time. After four years, I got my fir first line number. So it really it takes a lot of time to build these relationships with these people. We hand out, uh, you see, masks. Coffee is always uh, very, very welcome. Uh, tracts and yeah and you know, other cards as well um, those people they are often bored they go to Wan Hwai because they are bored they are lonely often they don't have anybody else left from their families so they go there and just spend their life there until it's over so yeah and often from the outside they look very fierce but actually they're very they're very kind-hearted but life has made them kind of uh, look very fierce from the outside. It's often also a protection. Yeah. So we go there and we invite those people. And we just saw, uh, are sowing seeds and hoping that they will grow over time. Yeah. I personally focus also more on the men. Uh, Often the prostitutes, the younger prostitutes, often they're guarded by men, by guards. 
which are protected, they're protecting them, but also they are um, um, also controlling them, and they're usually ta negotiating the price with the customers. Yeah, often these young women, they come into Taiwan on a tourist visa, they're from Vietnam or Thailand, and they stay a couple of weeks, two or three, maybe one or two weeks, and then they are exchanged by new women coming in. Yeah. So our goal is to actually go to these um, places and to meet those men and actually to get a relationship yeah, and just earn trust over time. Of, uh, two years ago, we started with a small uh, worship service. Uh, so we meet there and I preach there once in a month in Chinese. And the good thing is about the location, it's open. So uh, usually people are just gathering outside and they can listen to the sermon and they don't have to come in. Sometimes it's funny because I'm on the street and then people tell me, I've heard you preaching. And you're like, I've never seen you at the church. But they are often kind of just sitting outside on a motor bike and just are just listening to what we are saying or they hear the songs. And our goal is actually to, to, um, yeah, to expose them to God's word. Because they, all don't, they, they are just living in their microcosmos. You know? they, they are just living one or two streets. They don't go out of one place. They are just, yeah, they're just living in the, the, their kind of small world and don't leave it. We also have, a, my wife is doing that, Stephanie. Uh, she's uh, designing products and we have a handicraft class. It's actually to be, are doing products and we hope that these uh, uh, pro, um, products can be sold so that it's kind of an uh, alternative income for our women. Often they're older, our women, and it's not so easy to find something they are actually capable of doing because they're already yeah, quite old, they don't have a lot of skills, so it's not so easy to actually find something for them to, to do. Yeah. So Pastor Tim Keller said, that's a, he said, seeking people that have not ma yet make, made a decision for Jesus, they're, four, they're divided into four categories. The first is, uh, this is our, these are people within the church who haven't yet made a decision for God. Then there are those family and friends of church members. And there are unreached people, groups, or people far away, maybe cross-cultural mission, and these three categories, we re reach quite well as churches. But there is a fourth category, we are actually struggling. People outside of our social environment, outside of our social context. And it's very hard for the church for us to reach them. Because we in our daily lives, we don't actually meet them. You know, I don't know how many times you go to Wanhua <laughs> to actually be there. You know, I think probably not during your daily routine. You have, you just have the chance to go to, to, to Wanhua a lot of times. You know, it's just we don't meet these people. Th those people could be maybe foreigners or um, homeless people or yeah, people from the Red Light District. They're just people we don't actually, yeah, naturally see in our lives. It needs our kind of uh, initiative to go there, to meet those people and actually to bring this, this invitation to them. And that's a challenge, I think, in Taiwan, and it's a challenge in Switzerland as well, and probably every place on earth. Yeah, we as a pro family garden, our vision is actually to bring the gospel to women and men alike in uh, red light districts. I don't know if you know that each city in Taiwan has its own red light district. They look a little bit different. So in Wanhua, it's kind of like a market, it's very open. But then in Taichung, it's very close. It's like a dark alley, you know. And in Kaohsiung, it's next to the, the train station. Every red light district looks different in Taiwan. And we hope to bring the gospel to these uh, places. And we are also hoping to mobilize the local church, you know, 
that the local uh, Taiwanese uh, Christians are helping us and are actually going themselves to these places to reach their own people. And the last thing is a string of pearl around Taiwan. We hope to see kind of in each of these cities, we hope to see a church or Christians who, who are actually reaching out to these people. And as you can see, you know, uh, Tara, you know her missionary from OMF, she was here before. She started in Taipei in 2005, then Geelong started, which is quite uh, uh, independent now. Then in Sinshu, a pastor started, because their church was just next to a red light district. In Taichung, it's a missionary who started, but she can't really find local co-workers who want to do it with her. And then in Kaohsiung, a person from a church started to do this ministry. And at the moment, Tara still has three years until she uh, will be retired. So now that Pearl has actually become a Taiwanese NGO. So we hope that to kind of trans transfer that leadership to local hands. And we're really hoping to see local co-workers who actually just take up that burden and serve the, those women uh, and bring the gospel to them. Yeah, we hope to partnership with local churches, and I just want to thank you at this point for your help, actually. Oh, yeah, for your help to um, bring that gospel, to, to bring that invitation to the red light districts. Now, this invitation is not only brought to red light districts, but also to you personally this morning. God invites you personally this morning to actually accept this invitation because you're uh, just precious, precious to him. You're a pearl to God as well. And he wants to uh, show you his kindness, his love, his mercy. He wants to give you so much, from, so much good. Such, he has such a wonderful invitation for you this morning. He wants to win your heart and he wants to win your heart so may, that may, you may also one day say, blessed is the one who will eat at the feast of the kingdom of heaven. And that's what we all are hoping for, to see more and more people to actually be at that feast. And I think we will be surprised who is sitting there and we will rejoice and be happy together. Thank you very much for having me today. I will stay after the service, so if you have more questions about the Pearl, hey, uh, or you want to ask more questions, then feel free to approach me. You can speak to me in Chinese as well. Maybe it sounds more like a child talking to you a little bit more, but you're very welcome to, <laughs> to approach me after the service. Thank you very much for having me today.